Greetings, Earth and Space Explorers. Welcome to Doc Waller's Earth and Space Report for Friday, February 19th, 2021. I'm your host, Bill Waller, an astronomer, science educator, and communicator, coming to you on a wintry evening in Rockport, Massachusetts. These Earth and Space Reports are intended to engage and inform people like you who are curious about Earth as a planet, who care about our human relations with Earth's life-sustaining environment, and who wonder about the greater cosmos, including our place in space and moment in time. Video recordings of these reports are archived on the Earth and Space Reports YouTube channel. Today, we are joined by members of the Rockport Research Explorers, Rockport Cultural Council, and other curious folk. Thank you for coming. Our special guest for this evening is Ms. Emily Daly from San Diego. Uh, she is a 2015 graduate of Rockport High School who has gone on to pursue many exciting adventures in the fields of marine biology, environmental conservation, and science education. In my letter of recommendation for Emily back in 2014, I noted that despite being the only girl in my physics class, she managed to remain upbeat, engaged, and unbowed. Her multicolored notes are incredible. I could frame them, unquote. I also noted, quote, she is especially interested in law and government. She is fascinated by rules, their diverse uses and effects, unquote. To my surprise, Emily has since taken an altogether different trajectory, one that has her aboard sailing vessels, plying the seas, or onshore and maritime locales that teem with wildlife. So Emily, welcome to our little gathering. Thanks for having me. Very good. Uh, before you share with us your aquatic travelogue, could you please tell us how you left law and government, you left it behind, and became an oceanic explorer instead? Yeah, so uh, when I graduated from RHS in 2015, I definitely um, had some interest in environmental science. I always worked at the Gloucester Museum School Project Adventure Camp, if any of y'all are familiar with that. And so I had been doing experiential education teaching for a while in a more informal sense. Um, but I sort of felt like I had to leave that behind it. it uh, being a camp counselor forever didn't really seem like a viable uh, trajectory. And I wasn't necessarily interested in kind of what I, what I saw as being a scientist, you know, being in a lab and doing boring experiments all day. Um, and, and so that was kind of my my, the concept that I had in mind when I went into university as far as what it meant to be a scientist. And so I was uh, kind of pushing against that. And I originally, when I thought I was gonna pursue law, was interested in environmental law, um, but those classes just weren't, weren't super interesting to me. And so I kind of bounced around. I was a biology major for a while. I thought I was gonna be a psych major for a while. Um, and then eventually I just kind of landed on environmental science because that seemed, to, seemed like the most fun um, and I didn't know exactly what that meant for me, but when I switched to environmental science, uh, it made sense all of a sudden for me to do sea semester, which now that I work at sea semester, I realized that I probably could have done it with any major, but um, that made it seem a lot more applicable. And so that was pretty exciting um, because sea semester was something that I had always wanted to do. So in the eyes of my Florida State advisors, it made a lot more sense as an environmental science major. Hmm. Um, so that's kind of kind of how that trajectory went. I haven't entirely left law behind. There's always the possibility that I would do some sort of a, a policy, a science policy PhD program, but um, mm. becoming an attorney is probably not, not in the cards anymore. Right, not like your mother. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> not that I wouldn't wanna be just like my mom. She's a wonderful woman. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, very good. Well, uh, you're, you're welcome to uh, share your slides and uh, we'll take it from there. All right. There you go. Ah, great. Okay, so my presentation today is titled Sailing for Science, Experiential Education on the High Seas. So I'm going to be talking about my experience working at Sea Education Association, um, or as you might know at Sea Semester, which I will, from the beginning, differentiate from Semester at Sea, which you may also have heard of. 
Semester at Sea is a program that's on a cruise ship that goes to like 12 countries. That is not, not where I work. That's not what I do. So if that's your mental picture, get that out of your head. That's not it. Um, this little boat right here actually isn't that little. This boat is about 134 feet. It's a ship. It's a brigantine rigged tall ship. It's the Corrith Kramer based out of Woods Hole, Massachusetts. And in the background, you can see the Block Island wind farm off the coast of Rhode Island, um, which makes the boat look pretty small, but those turbines are actually really, really large. So the boat is not, it's not small. It can fit 40 people sleeping on it at any given time, and it's capable of oceanic journeys. And so um, at sea semester, we bring undergraduate students to sea for periods of up to six weeks on what would legally be termed the high seas international waters. Uh, and so that's where I work. And so I'm gonna talk about that today. Um, the format of my presentation, I, I have written notes and I have it in sort of a formal structure, but if people have questions, feel free to turn your microphones on and jump in at any time because I'm not necessarily sure uh, what parts of this are interesting to all of y'all. And now that I see that there's some, uh, some younger students on the call, maybe y'all might be interested in being students. And so if you have questions about uh, see semester as it pertains to you rather than you know as it pertains to me as my workplace um, feel free to jump on i'm happy to answer those questions on this on this presentation okay so like dr weller said i was a um i was a rockport high school student and as i said i worked at the gloucester museum school project adventure camp um, during my time at Rockport High School and a little bit after. And this was kind of my first uh, brush with experiential education. So in these photos, you can see uh, some students who are probably all around uh, high school age now. So you might even know some of these students. Um, but at GMS, we would basically go to interesting places in our backyard right on Cape Ann. So uh, the left photo was taken at Red Rocks in Gloucester off of 133 or 128. Um, and the two right photos are at Rafe's Chasm, which is also in Gloucester. We would spend a lot of time at Halibut Point. Um, so, so we spent a little bit of time in Rockport, but these are all places that we're familiar with. And basically the, the concept of this camp was to take students, take campers uh, to a cool place and hang out and allow them to develop their own questions. And the required reading for being a counselor at EMS was Rachel Carson's The Sense of Wonder, which is a, a short book uh, that kind of talks about children's natural curiosity um, and that's that's what we tried to culture at GMS. We would you know bring students to a place where there were some cool rocks and then undoubtedly the students would ask questions about the rocks and we would end up with a really interesting discussion about geology and local history and I always found this this version of teaching to be really compelling. Um, I just didn't necessarily have an image for how I could make it my career at the time of graduating from Rockport High School and, and working at GMS. So when I started school at Florida State University in 2015, uh, like I said, I bounced around a fair bit with, with majors and my time at SCA is really kind of what solidified, okay, um, environmental science is something that I can do and I can make a career out of. Um, and so I do have, I have future plans with this that don't just include being on tall ships working at SCA, but that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So Sea Education Association is, in a nutshell, a study abroad organization in which undergraduate students take classes in biology, oceanography, nautical science, policy, and some humanities during both a short component in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, and at sea aboard one of our two tall ships. So we have the Corth Kramer and we have the Robert C. Siemens, and they're very similar in a lot of ways. They're both 134 foot uh, brigantine rigged tall ships. Um, but I'm going to read you SEA's mission statement because I think it sort of gets to the core of, of our goals here better than I can um, and in a, in a more coherent way. Um, so SEA is a global teaching, learning, and research community dedicated to the exploration, understanding, and stewardship of marine and maritime environments. SEA empowers students with life-changing sea voyages of scientific and cultural discovery, academic rigor, and personal growth. Our sea semester program features an interdisciplinary curriculum and dynamic leadership development experience at sea aboard tall ships and on shore. 
Um, and so SEA is kind of the, the more grown up version of the GMS camp that I worked at and attended during my time at Cape, um, during my time on Cape Ann as a kid. Um, so I, I like to say that I just kind of leveled up and, and moved offshore. So now I'm doing a very, very similar thing on ships, bringing, bringing students to a really unfamiliar place and allowing them to, to ask questions based on what we find. Um, SEA is accredited through Boston University. And so the logistics of it are basically the students from all over the US and, and even all over the world. We always have a few international students on every trip um, come to our campus in Woods Hole and they take some classes and then they go to sea on board, on board our two tall ships um, in a group of about anywhere from like 10 to 24, depending on how particularly um, popular that program is. Um, but yeah, yeah. we gonna talk a little bit more about our campus in Woods Hole. So if you've heard of Woods Hole, you, you may have just gone on vacation there. All of you guys live in Massachusetts. Um, but if you've heard of it and you haven't been there, the reason why might be because you've heard of the Woods Hole Institution, a world-renowned uh, research and teaching, a little bit of teaching institution in oceanography. But Woods Hole is actually unique because there are um, six, well, depending on what you, you know, there are some smaller institutions as well, but there are some six large educational institutions that are all focused on marine and earth science in a really small area. Woods Hole is a village in the town of Falmouth. So I feel like Falmouth is like the size of Gloucester and Woods Hole might be a little bit smaller than Rockport. So it's a really small space to have a lot of um, thoughtful scientists, but you have the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You have the Marine Biological Laboratory, which is affiliated with the University of Chicago. You've got the, uh, the USGS, the US Geological Survey, you've got the Woods Hole Research Center, and you've got Sea Education Association, so where I work. Um, and that's pretty unique for our students when they're, when they're on shore in Woods Hole, because we have access not only to those really interesting researchers who work at all of those institutions who can just come in for lunch break and give a talk that, you know, otherwise you might only see at a, at a national conference. Um, but also because we can literally use um, the resources of those institutions. So although we're not technically um, accredited through HUI, uh, with Oceanographic Institution, we can use a lot of their, we can use their property. So we have access to their library as well as their online library. So all of their journals, um, which is something the SEA wouldn't be able to offer if it were in a different physical location, just because it's a relatively small nonprofit. Um, institution. We also keep one of our vessels, the Korth Kramer, on Woods Hole property for a good chunk of the year in the summertime. So if you've ever seen a tall ship in Woods Hole, it probably was the Korth Kramer. Um, so that's kind of what our shore component, those are the perks of our shore component. Students spend anywhere from two to six weeks there in Woods Hole um, on a pretty intense high school style schedule. So you go to college and you get used to having, you know, a couple classes in the morning and like maybe something in the afternoon and the rest of the, your day is for whatever you want. Um, and that's not the style at C semester. Uh, you have class from eight to four every day, five days a week um, and plenty of homework. So it's not like it's all just happening in the classroom. It's a really intense experience, but that's super intentional because our our semester programs are really only 12 or 13 weeks in length in total. Um, and then you're cramming a lot of that, that academic component into that, into that short component. And we need to set up students with a lot of skills so that they can be successful, um, both with their academic goals at sea, as well as their kind of more personalized research goals. And we also try to outfit them with some sailing skills before they get on the boat. So uh, the short component is really intense, but um, it's a it's a cool place to be in a pretty cool environment of a lot of interesting scientists. Um, and then the campus that everyone cares a lot more about are the two ships. So on the top left, you've got the Robert C. Siemens. Um, actually, both of the top photos are of the Robert C. Siemens. That's our Pacific vessel. And it operates largely in the South Pacific Ocean. So we spend about half of our year in New Zealand, and then we bounce around um, to Fiji, Samoa, Hawaii. Right now we're in California, which is sort of a, a funny thing that's more because of COVID rather than because of a particular cruise track. Um, but over the next few months, we'll be offering cruise tracks out of California. So if that's something you're interested in, uh, we, will, we will be in and out of San Diego for about the next six months. 
Um, and then on the bottom, we have the Corwith Kramer, which is our vessel that operates mostly in the Atlantic. Um, so we're up in the North Atlantic for a lot of the year. And then we head down through the Sargasso Sea in the fall. We spend the summer in the Caribbean, and then we head back north in the spring, back through the Sargasso Sea. Um, and so different programs that sort of line up with, you know, we have like a coral reef expedition that's going to happen in the Caribbean, um, whereas some of our programs that need larger uh, oceanographic spatial arrays are going to happen on those longer cruise tracks from, you know, Massachusetts or Maine down to down to the Caribbean. So those are the air areas that our ships encompass. Um, you notice that from the outside, they look pretty similar. They're both two masted because they're brigantine rigged. So they have four and a half sails. So if you think of a boat, um, like you have the front of the boat here and the stern over here, um, four and a half sails kind of stay in that same plane, whereas square soles are perpendicular to that plane. And so a brigantine rigged ship is one that has uh, square soles on the, on the forward mast. Um, so it's kind of a cool rig because it, it has some of the more traditional elements of tall ship sailing. Those square soles require a lot more effort than four and a half sails do. So if you're familiar with schooners, schooners don't have square soles. So the Lannan and the Adventure, um, boats that you know y'all might be more familiar with being from Cape Ann, um, our boats are somewhat similar, but they have some, some differences too. Um, and they make up campus. So you get on this boat and, and sometimes you're gonna be, they're gonna be on it for six weeks straight. I just ran a program like that a couple months ago. We didn't stop on shore one time. Um, and sometimes you'll be kind of bopping around to different islands. So it just depends on the cruise track, but that's what the ships look like. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the logistics of life at sea. Um, so with any of our programs, we're always gonna be on a watch schedule. And so the way this works is all of our students get split into three different watches. We have A watch, B watch, and C watch. And then each of those groups, which will be four to eight students, uh, stand with both a mate and a scientist. So a mate has uh, a license, they work underneath the captain and their, their job is um, the safety of the ship, the navigation of the ship, setting and striking sails and teaching students about, about that. Um, and then my job is as an assistant scientist. So I work with the mate uh, to teach students about uh, how to do oceanographic deployments, um, and I do a little bit of mentoring on their long-term research projects, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, but our, our boats sail for science, so um, you, we can't do our science without the students learning how to sail and getting the, the boat from point A to point B, um, because we, we're often trying to sample at very specific um, either geographic, geographical locations or just we're trying to get to a particular oceanographic province. Um, and so it's really important that our students learn how to sail as quickly as possible um, so that we can do our science. Uh, but then it's also really important that our students, you know, learn, learn the logistics of deploying instruments and processing our samples because once we get to that spot, we want to be able to, to do all of our science fairly quickly. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty crazy learning experience your first two weeks at sea. Uh, you're just going to be basically learning. You're just going to get, we always make them, we always use the metaphor that we're kind of throwing spaghetti at a wall and seeing what sticks. And the goal is that different things will stick with different st students. Um, but that first two weeks is pretty overwhelming because for the first time students are, you know, working for six hours and then they're asleep for 12 and then they're awake for six hours and then they're asleep for 12. So you're not on a normal sleep schedule. You might have watch from one in the morning until seven in the morning. Um, and then you would have watch again the next day just after lunch at 1300. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty wild, pretty wild life, but um, our students get used to it pretty quickly. Um, and then after they start to kind of le learn the ropes, learn the lines, um, weeks two through four are focused mostly on uh, kind of seeing all the things that we, so me as the assistant scientist and the mate were doing behind the scenes. So, um, you know, at the beginning I might say, okay, can you go out on deck and, you know, set up this net? I'll be out to help you. And then the next two weeks I'll say, okay, go set up that net. You know how to do that at this point. Um, and then the last two weeks, this is kind of that, that leadership and, and growth component. We have our, our j wo j lo phase. And that's when students have learned how, how to sail. They've learned how to do the science that we do. And 
they take a lot of ownership in that and we kind of go hands off as the as the watch officers. Um, so that's kind of how the progression of the trip goes as far as like what we expect from students, basically more every single day, um, but there are some some clear cutoff points every two weeks. Um, yeah, that's kind of how how life at sea works. And I've kind of referenced uh, deck and science. Um, those are the kind of the ways that we split students up and they're, they're the main components of your time at sea. You're either gonna be out on deck, um, setting sails, navigating at the helm, at forward lookout, or you're gonna be in science with me. Um, and when we're in science, we're, we're doing oceanographic deployments just like any, any other research boat that you may be familiar with. So we have um, some pretty serious equipment on board. We're not just throwing a net in the water and, and calling it science. Um, we have we have some pretty some pretty serious oceanographic equipment that's just scaled down for the size of our ship. So a lot of the, the brands that we use um, for our for our equipment are the same as what you'd see on like a Huey ship or um, a University of Washington research vessel. Pretty pretty similar stuff. Okay, I'm going to briefly talk about nautical science because technically it is science and this is a science presentation. Um, but keep in mind that this is not necessarily my wheelhouse. This isn't what I teach. So this is what the mate would teach when students or what the captain would teach when the students were on shore and what the mate would teach once the students were at sea. And so navigation is a huge part of any journey, particularly our long ocean passages. So for example, on my student trip, we sailed from Christchurch, New Zealand, all the way to Papaete on Tahiti in French Polynesia, which is about, it ended up being about a 4,400 nautical mile journey. And so there's a lot of opportunities to get lost. Um, and navigation is the first thing that you learn during your shore component. You're gonna start looking at nautical charts, learning how to plot GPS positions. As time goes on, you're gonna learn what's called dead reckoning navigation. So the students um, basically, you know, we get a GPS position at, let's say, noon, and then we know that for the next hour we sailed um, north, and then we know the speed that we were sailing, and we uh, kind of estimate where we would be based on that. And so we do that for several hours, and, and students can get pretty, pretty effective at their, um, their dead reckoning skills at that point. Uh, we then upgrade to the, the serious navigation, the more traditional navigation, which is celestial navigation. And so in the background, you can see an outline of one of my friends who has a sextant. And so basically she is taking a, taking a line of position um, using a star. So she knows where the star is in the sky. She knows the day of the year. And she's um, calculating the angle between the star and the horizon. And then we kind of triangulate our position using three of those, three or more of those. Um, and so that's a pretty cool scientific thing that happens, not, not technically in the science department, but very much is scientific and is um, a cool thing to, to learn about as a student and also as a scientist when I have a chance to get out on deck. Um, another huge part of being out on deck in nautical science is the meteorology that students learn about in a more conceptual way. They don't necessarily have tests on meteorology, but we learn a lot about like, okay, you see that cumulus cloud over there. What's going to happen in a few minutes? Okay, there's going to be a downdraft. It's going to get really windy. What does that mean for our sail plan? Um, so it's really applied meteorology for the most part. Um, we do have some, some large scale weather charts that come in um, through different technology that we have on board and students will look at those and learn a little bit more about large scale forecasting, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting applied version of neurology that you don't necessarily get in um, a university setting, at least not at, at like a undergraduate non-meteorology major level. <coughs> Excuse me. And then students learn about sail theory, which is just physics, um, which is, you know, super interesting and people spend their whole lives learning how to trim sails perfectly. And that's not what happens on our ships, but we learn about, okay, if it's, if it's super windy, what sails are we gonna set? If it's really light winds, what sails are we gonna set? If we wanna stay in one place, what sails will we take down or what sails will we set? Um, so yeah, there's a lot of science that happens out on deck, but most of our science happens in the lab. And so just so that you 
can have a conceptual understanding. I know that most people probably haven't spent time in uh, a lab on a boat. It's a little bit different than a lab that you would see in a school or at a university. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we have our, our science deck and you can see I'm the one in the pink hat and then that's my student Karen on the left. And we were deploying a free CTD. I'll talk about what a CTD is in a second, but you can also kind of see that gray frame that's just kind of where my head is right behind me. And basically uh, the winch, which is the center picture, um, is holding that instrument in the air and then it's led through that frame that you can see that aluminum, aluminum frame in the background. And we're able to deploy a lot of interest instruments off of our science deck. And so um, even though it's technically part, part of the, the deck, it's not indoors, it's not in a lab, um, that very much is the, the first step in all of our science is, is deploying stuff off the boat, getting the stuff back on board and figuring out what data we can, we can use from, from that process. And then on the right hand side, I don't have very many pictures of our labs, but um, that's me with that same student, Karen. She is running, um, I think we're doing a phosphate run. And so um, I'm kind of watching over everyone, not doing much. That was during JWO phase. And so the students were sort of leading the way at that point. Um, but you can see in the background, there's a bunch of tubes, there's some samples in the foreground. Uh, we've got some students on computers. So it very much is a working lab. It's just a small space uh, where things move around a lot. Uh, and so once we collect our data, we spend a lot of time in the lab processing. And I'd say that I probably spend 80% of the time, uh, my time on board in the lab, on the computer, just processing data, getting things inputted, getting things, checking data, making sure that everything that we've done kind of lines up with, with common sense. Uh, you know, do these numbers make sense? Does, is this something that a student was seasick and they wrote down the wrong number or, or is this right? Uh, so that's how I spend a lot of my time is, is in the lab. But the fun part is out on deck uh, using the winch and deploying gear. Okay, so you just saw me and Karen deploying that free CTD. Uh, and a lot, I'm going to talk right now about kind of the different types of science that we do and the instruments that we use to collect that data. Um, so that free CTD, CTD stands for conductivity, temperature, and depth or density. And the conductivity is a proxy for salinity. And so if you have uh, the temperature and the salinity of the water in the ocean, and you know sort of generally where you are in the world, you can know a lot about that, that water mass that you're in. Um, water mass is a pretty specific term. It, it has to do with the density of the water in any given part of the ocean. Um, and it changes with depth as well as spatially throughout different oceans. Um, and so the CTD alone is a really helpful piece of equipment. I'll scroll back for a second, just in case you're not, you're not picturing it, but you can see it's, it's pretty small and it's just kind of a tube. We have it in a frame to protect it. Um, and then on the right here, they're back on, back on this slide, we have what's called the carousel. And this is still basically a CTD. It's just a CTD with a bunch of stuff added to it. Um, and this is probably the most impressive piece or I guess conglomerate of equipment that we have on board. Um, that CTD tells us a lot, a lot about where we are. I mean, just putting that in the water um, can tell us about all the water masses that we're, we're sailing over. Um, but when we deploy the CTD with all this other gear on, on the carousel, um, we have the CTD itself, which tells you, which tells kind of the computer um, you know, what, what the temperature and what the salinity of any, you know, of the water as you're going, as you're going down through the water column. And then we also have an AFM, an automated firing module. And so you can see that this, this carousel is surrounded by a bunch of what look to be like tubes and they're actually bottles. And so when we send them down, they're, they're open. And right now in this picture, we're retrieving the carousel. So they're all closed. Um, but basically we can, we can program the automated firing module, the AFM, to fire at specific depths. So we send this gear all the way to the bottom. It doesn't do much, but on the way back up, that's when the magic happens. The CTD talks to the AFM and the AFM says, okay, it's, we're at this depth, we're at this pressure. This is where you wanted to close, right? And the CTD says, yep. And then the AFM sends um, a magnetic pulse and it closes the bottle. And so we can have, 12 distinct water samples 
from 12 distinct depths and each Niskin bottle represents one of those depths. Um, so when this really pretty strictly uh, chemical oceanography instrument gets up on board, you know, we can, we can extract a lot of interesting data um, like carbon data. So pH and alkalinity, we can, we can take that water and process it for those variables, but we can also look at, okay, we, we have this, this water from this very specific depth. We can look at more um, physical, I guess, biological um, parameters like microplastics, like phytoplankton, like to some extent zooplankton. Um, but we have just a discrete water mass from a given depth, which is just pretty amazing. And when I say depth, I'm talking to, you know, over a thousand meters. We're, this isn't 10 feet deep. This is really, really deep in the ocean, um, deep enough to have some uh, larger oceanographic, we can see some larger oceanographic trends, which is pretty cool. Um, some of the sensors that we can add to the carousel. So you're not gonna be able to see any of these in this picture. They're relatively small. We kind of just stick them wherever they fit. Um, but we have a PAR sensor. So our PAR sensor looked at, looks at photosynthetically active radiation. So basically light. Um, we have a DO sensor, a dissolved oxygen sensor, and that senses oxygen in the water column. Um, we have a chlorophyll A fluorometer. So chlorophyll A is the um, is like a proxy for phytoplankton. So we, we can kind of know what phytoplankton communities look like at depth using this fluorometer. We have a CDOM, so a color dissolved organic matter sensor. Um, so that tells us about uh, the organic matter and detritus that's in the surrounding water column that might be blocking out uh, light coming from the surface. And we have a transmissometer. So that looks at water clarity. Um, and that sort of looks a little bit more at a mix of turbidity from, you know, maybe if we're in shallower water, there might be some sediment that's gotten kicked up. Um, so that tells us a little bit about, about water clarity. And so we can have any permutation of these sensors on the carousel at any given time that we want for, and, and depending on where we are, you know, we might care a lot near shore about, you know, chlorophyll A because there's all this runoff, there's so many nutrients in the water near shore. Um, so we might be interested in, you know, particularly chlorophyll A. Um, so we may add that sensor on and then we might get out into the middle of Sargasso Sea and know that productivity is, you know, fairly low. And we might not have any students who are particularly interested in chlorophyll A at that given point. So we might take that sensor off. So it's, it's not, um, what's on the carousel is not stagnant. That can change at any given point. And it just depends on, depends on what the chief scientist and the students want to be looking at. And it's my job to make it happen. Um, the other instrument that we have is our flow through system. So deploying the carousel or the C2D, as you can probably guess, um, is a bit of a process. It involves getting the boat to a place. It involves stopping the boat most of the time. Um, we could technically tow those things through the water, but we don't generally want to. Um, and so we can only do this, you know, as many times as as many times a day as we want to stop the boat and go through this production. So sometimes the carousel might be in the water for an hour and a half, and we can't really do much else when that's happening. Uh, but sometimes we want to still be collecting in data. And we can't get data from the bottom of the ocean while we're sailing. It's just, it's not possible for us. But we can get data from the surface ocean through what's called our flow through system. So we have a, a hole in our hull, it's an intentional hole um, that pumps seawater through a, a set of tubes. Uh, just like uh, in the background of that photo when I pointed out all that tubing, that was our flow through system. Um, and we have sensors there as well. And the sensors are the same as what we can have on our, on our carousel. And so we can have a steady stream every couple seconds of what the water that we're currently passing through is like with regard to these parameters. So um, it's pretty cool. We have a, a pretty wide suite of what we can collect. Um, we're not always uh, using all these sensors. So, you know, generally we don't have the PAR sensor on the flow through. I don't think I've ever seen that, but we almost always have transmissometer data. We almost always have chlorophyll A data and we always, almost always have CDOM data um, from our flow through system. So it's pretty cool, I think. Um, the chemical oceanography is sort of where my interests lie the most, but most people I would say are more interested in our biological oceanography or our marine biology that we collect while we're at sea. And we do a lot of biology. We do a lot of biological oceanography and we do a lot of, um, we spend a lot of time looking at microscopes, looking at phytoplankton and zooplankton. 
Um, so this is a huge, huge part of what students are, are learning during their time at sea. Uh, but we have, we have a bunch of different ways to collect biological oceanography data. The biggest one being our Neustan net that we always deploy twice a day. So that's that right hand photo. And we always put that in for half an hour, twice a day. Um, and we tow it at two knots. So we're, we're getting one nautical mile of coverage twice a day um, throughout every single cruise track. And because of that particular tow, we actually have a really unique set of microplastics data that goes back almost 40 years. Um, we also tow, or we also, we don't tow phytoplankton nets, but we can put a phytoplankton net over while the boat is um, stationary. It's a pretty fine mesh. So if we were to tow it, we would likely rip it. And uh, once in a while, we might have a student who's interested in bacteria. And so we, we have the capabilities to culture for bacteria on board as well. Everybody loves marine biology. Um, we're not necessarily outfitted to uh, contribute to the larger research community when it comes to marine biology, but we certainly experience it in a really, uh, a really up close way. So on the left, we have an albatross. I took this photo when it was just sitting watching us deploy some gear in New Zealand. Um, and it's pretty crazy that you're able to get this close to an albatross. So some of our students choose to study um, seabirds uh, or floating plastic, you know, they take more of a qualitative approach and, and have people pay pretty close attention to what's what's happening around the ship. Um, at the top of every hour, students go out on deck. So we'll have one student go out on deck with a clipboard and they, for exactly six minutes, observe exactly what's happening around the ship with regard to seabirds, with regard to, in the Sargasso Sea, we would look for sargassum, um, plastic, uh, sometimes bioluminescence even, uh, marine megafauna, so turtles, dolphins, whales, um, and depending where we are, you know, different, different ratios of those things are present and, and make for interesting data. But um, we do kind of include that, that more qualitative and interesting aspect, um, interesting in the sense that it's interesting to the observer. Um, and that's kind of what students expect when they come to see, and it's a, it's a cool way for for them to slow down and go on deck and see some interesting things, even if uh, the data isn't necessarily our most, most accurate. Um, we also have a hydrophone on board, which we, again, just use sort of for fun. Um, when, we're at Stellwagen, when we're at Stellwagen Bank, we'll always pull out the hydrophone to try to hear some whales, but it's not generally used in student projects. Um, we also have the capabilities to do some physical oceanographic research while we're on board. We have um, an ADCP, so an acoustic Doppler current profiler. So that tells us about the currents that are below our ship's hull at a variety of depths. Um, this transducer is kind of a, a big kid toy, as well as the one below it, the chirp. Um, they both kind of are almost, almost too complicated, the data that they spit out um, for you know, for a lot of student projects, just because it's a constant flow of a lot of data. It's, it's big data. It's hard to work with on, on laptops, but we always have, we always have those running. So our ADCP is looking at currents and our chirp is looking at the bathymetry um, underneath the ship. So we always know uh, what the, what the sediment underneath the ship. Well, if we're in shallow waters, we can know what the sediment looks like and what the layering is in that sediment. If we're in deep waters, we can just kind of get a pretty vague idea of how deep, how deep the ocean that we're in is. If we're in, you know, 4,000 meters of water, we don't have a high definition um, picture of the, of the bathymetry, but we do know, you know, okay, how, how deep is the water that we're in? Um, and so both of these use um, some technology that's pretty on par with what research vessels use. And so this is information that, you know, if someone at HUI was, look, was looking for information from us, we could easily send them these files, um, whereas our six minute ops for students aren't necessarily something that we would send to an outside scientist. And we do some geological oceanography. This is a picture of me and one of my students, Lucia. We had just done a ship back and I dropped the bucket and it got all the mud from the bottom of uh, Menemsha Bight off of Martha's Vineyard, uh, got all over her and she was a really good sport about it. Um, but we can send basically this pretty scary claw down to the bottom of the ocean. We, we get it 
once we get it rigged and it's ready to go, nobody puts their fingers near it. And then we basically deploy it at a pretty fast speed. It slams into the bottom of the ocean and we get a big bucket of mud. Um, so there's no stratification for the most part, but it's a cool way to look at what organisms might be down there, what sort of sediment we're looking at. And we can sieve this and uh, see, see where we're at as far as sediment goes. It's not a huge part of our, um, research plan most of the time, just because we're not generally in waters shallow enough to do this. But um, generally at the beginning of the cruise track, we'll do a couple of these and wherever we're allowed to, often in the Caribbean, Caribbean we are, and in the South Pacific, we aren't generally given clearance to do shipwrecks. So the different boats sort of um, do different amounts of sediment data, just depending on what the countries that we're sailing through are okay with. We have the capabilities to do gravity cores on both boats. So that would allow us to see um, some sediment stratification. I personally haven't done one of these um, and they're sort of, they're, they're deployments that are kind of held for specific uh, students who really want to look at uh, sediment stratification or if we have, you know, some sort of particular goal for that cruise track that we really want to get a gravity core in um, just because it's really like dropping an anchor using our hydrographic wire. It's a really big deal. It's a really heavy thing. Um, it's if, if we're in rolling seas at all, it's not possible. Um, but we do potentially have the, the capabilities to do a gravity core, which is pretty cool. I'd like to see one at some point. And I've mentioned student projects a bunch, but basically while students are on their shore component, they pick a couple of parameters that they might be interested in. So I looked at um, pH and alkalinity. So I was looking at like carbonate chemistry when I was a student, but we have students looking at all different um, all different parameters and how they relate to each other. And so mine, you know, you would kind of pH and alkalinity are, are just traditionally linked. And it's unsurprising that someone would look at both of those at one time, but we have students who look at, you know, microplastics and sargassum. We have students who look at chlorophyll A concentrations and the physical oceanography of a region. Um, so students can take a really creative approach to what parameters they particularly are interested in. And then they can decide whether they want to just look at that those trends spatially. So throughout our cruise track, if they want to look at temporal data, so if they want to look at data from our cruises through that same, you know, oceanographic area, that same water mass from previous years, or even look at data even further back. So look at other um, other organizations' data. It just kind of depends on how science focused that particular student and that particular program are. Um, but students can really get into the weeds. They might be looking at like our CHIRP data or our ADCP data, which is um, pretty impressive and uh, very much kind of university level upper division science. Or they might be using those six minute OBS to give us some information about what seabirds we saw and where we saw them. And both of those are super legitimate and they fit into our um, experiential education model. Um, but yeah, we, we see both of those. Um, and then my job as an assistant scientist, like most of my job, like I said, is deploying the gear and teaching students how to deploy the gear, but I also help mentor particular projects. So I generally get more of the chemical oceanography students. Um, I take them under my wing and mentor them just because that's what I feel the most comfortable teaching. And we want, we want to give the best possible mentoring mentorship that we can. Um, and then at the end of the trip, uh, students give a pretty pretty incredible 15 minute presentation uh, at sea in rolling seas with a couple whiteboards and a friend holding it up. Um, and they tend to be really interesting, even as someone who, you know, might have mentored that project. Um, it's pretty amazing what students can come up with after, you know, being at sea and writing their project while seasick and uh, their only presentation me uh, method being a whiteboard. They don't have any way to really show um, anything super technical, uh, you know, they don't necessarily, they're not necessarily able to do what you'd be able to do at um, like a national conference, um, but the data that they convey is, is pretty impressive. So that's one of my favorite parts of the trip. And I will leave it there. I think I ended up talking for longer than I meant to anyway. So, um, if people have questions, I know this is like my whole life and this is what I do constantly. So I might've left out some, some really big picture thing and you're just confused about what I was even talking about when I mentioned 
something or if you have specific questions about specific parameters that we look at in science, I'm open to that as well. But thanks for listening. Uh, this is great. Uh, if you could stop sharing your screen and so we could get our, our gallery up of, of folks and um, maybe uh, we'll be lucky. Feel free to show yourselves in, in the video um, and we'll hope that the uh, connection uh, still works. Uh, so uh, do we have any questions uh, from, uh, from any of you? Okay, Patrick, unmute. Good. I just had a quick question regarding, um, actually like, uh, how do I say this? Marine biology at like deep sea levels. Are you able to do any like deep sea animal stuff like that? Yeah, so um, at, yeah. In the deep sea, kind of what we're able to do is we have meter nets. So there was a picture um, of me with like a pretty big net on deck and we can actually deploy that using that hydro wire. So it can go even deeper than our chemical oceanography instruments can just because you know a net isn't rated to any particular depth. Um, so we can send that as deep as we want and we can tow that for as long as we want. So uh, we are able to collect some pretty cool stuff. Uh, I've caught like heteropods, which are um, really cool marine snails that um, they generally don't do super well once we bring them up to the surface just because of the pressure difference. But for a little while, they look at elephants and they have a, a really large, uh, they're really sparsely populated. So it's pretty cool that we're able to see things like that. Um, but yeah, small things we can see at a pretty, pretty great depth. Um, we don't necessarily have the ability to look at like communities of larger organisms at depth. So like, um, I don't know, some of the interesting things in like Blue Planet, like we're not, we're not looking at that yet, who knows, someday maybe, but uh, yeah, nets and, and zooplankton are definitely part of our, part of our curriculum. Good, good. Uh, any other questions? Okay, I, I'll butt in. I have uh, three questions. And they all have to do with um, uh, records. Uh, what was the hottest temperature of water you ever sampled? Ooh, um, I would say in the well. Like, so we usually sample in our science stuff is in Celsius. We have sampled some pretty high temperatures when we were going through the Gulf Stream, so above 35 Celsius. Um, but even off the coast of Massachusetts, um, with the Hui MIT joint program, when we sailed with them a couple summers ago, we went in search of a warm water blob and we found it. And it was, uh, I think that was the most surprisingly warm just because it was in a pretty temperate environment. I don't specifically remember what the temperature is like when I sailed in French Polynesia, because I didn't. Yeah, I'd imagine uh, pretty, that was pretty warm. Pretty warm. Uh, but I don't specifically remember. Okay, uh, second question. Uh, what are the deepest samples that you were able to obtain? How deep? Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of our cruise, we have to do some maintenance on our wire. And so that's when we always kind of run whatever instruments we have on our carousel as deep as we possibly can go. Um, so probably like 1500 meters mm -hmm. maybe but that happens pretty consistently you know we don't necessarily go uh super deep for any particular reason we kind of stick within stick within the ranges that we always i don't know go with and this is just a, a this is a side question um did you ever sample the um the atlantic rise the what is it called? The, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge? Um, no, I don't think I've gone far enough east, question mark. Yeah, it's like halfway. Yeah, I think, I think I've always been further inland than that. Okay. Yeah. But SCA has. SCA has done transatlantic voyages in the past, so other people have, just not me personally. Because that would have some volcanic activity associated with it. That would be mm -hmm. 
Okay, and then this is a sailing question. Uh, what were the highest winds that you've ever had to deal with? So I'm a really, really good person to ask that question. Uh, my student trip was actually the, we had the highest winds ever recorded on any SEA voyage ever. We had a really, we ended up being uh, in a, not in an ocean, not in a cyclone, but we were avoiding a cyclone and ended up finding some other really crazy weather. Um, but we were in winds of over 90 knots, which is um, over 100 miles an hour hurricane <laughs> strength winds, uh, 25 to 30 foot seas. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and I bet everybody got seasick. You know, at that point, we were pretty used to being at sea and uh, the, the professional crew were so focused on sailing that I don't think they even had time. And the rest of us had been properly medicated. We knew that it was coming. So um, I don't, that doesn't really, we felt a lot of things, but seasickness wasn't necessarily uh, top of the list, which is kind of strange. Yeah. Yep. But we'd already been at sea for a few weeks. So we were kind of acclimatized. Me. Well, I can imagine you've had uh, adventure after adventure uh, yeah. on the seas, but you, You've also been posting on your Facebook page uh, pictures uh, from ashore. You, you, you spent some time ashore where you saw a lot of whales and otters. And, and oh, yeah. That was a different job. I worked uh, in, the, in the fishing industry in Southeast Alaska this summer just to try something different in mm -hmm. COVID times when we couldn't have students. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful part of the world I would highly recommend, but we don't go there on our... Okay. I wish maybe someday. <laughs> uh, that's wonderful. Uh, I've run out of questions. Anybody else has have any questions? Okay. Well, you've made us all very jealous. Oh, not the goal. <laughs> <laughs> well, made me jealous. That that's for sure. Uh, I wish I could just be uh, like a hair bobble uh, as you go do all your things. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, a lot of a lot of our participants were uh, high school age. So if any of them are interested, I'm happy to give my contact information. Um, and if they're ever interested in doing one of our high school programs or one of our semester programs, um, we would very much welcome them. Okay. Well, that's fabulous. Um, uh, thrilled to have had you come aboard here. Thank you so much for having me. It was, it was great to share. Okay. Uh, I will, I have it recording. And so I will uh, get it onto the YouTube channel and send the posting around. Great. Great. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Yes. Have a good one. Stay warm. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>